Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good evening. Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. So we are broadcasting uh, today from StreamYard and the channels are linked in and YouTube. If you can be so kind and put in the comments that you can hear us and see us because it's taking a bit, you know, time before it's connected. I can see now there are some people. I will also check on my phone. I'll, you know, put there my LinkedIn so I can, you know, see. And as we're getting started and people are leaving some comments yeah. that they can hear us. Good maybe... evening from Finland, yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Yeah. I thought maybe people could add a comment because next Thursday is my birthday. So what wow. do you think? What should I do to celebrate now that COVID's going yeah. on and it's kind of yeah. hard to go out? What should I do? So if you have any good ideas, pop them in the comments there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it something special. You may you may run like a half marathon, you know, something really special. <laughs> so guys, Vladimir is here, you know, absolutely. There are like 20 okay. people I can see on LinkedIn. If you can put there that you can see us and hear us, you know, everybody, and we can, you know, start, right? Because yeah. it's a, I think it, it is, uh, you know, slower. I think on LinkedIn, I, I see like up-to-date information, not necessarily here. Yeah. And okay. So uh, looks like at least, you know, uh, some people from uh, uh, from uh, LinkedIn and, and from YouTube are there. So let's start. And we would like to have it again, you know, as much as interactive as possible, right? We picked up the team imposter syndrome. So I would ask my colleague, Lisa, to talk a bit what is it because i think to put everybody on the same you know page uh and then i can give you some cases both from the business and really from the top business people and some even like olympic games winners having this you know imposter uh syndrome and then we can talk how you you can you know face it and why do we have it at all and what we can do with it you know right okay. yes and Jan, before we kick off, we want to introduce ourselves and let everyone know why are yeah. we sitting here telling? And I'm going to raise my hand and say, yes, I think we're both people who have suffered from imposter syndrome, yeah. but I do want to tell everyone why that's a good thing. But first, my name is Lisa Kristen. I'm the CEO of Kristen Coaching and Consulting. We're a boutique leadership consulting firm. We do executive coaching for ultra elite, super high top performers. And we work with some of the household names that you've heard of, like Google and Nova and Dell and Mars, and we make sure leaders are ready for the future of work. So it's not so easy with what we're dealing with today, not just because of the pandemic and not just because of digital transformation, but how complex, how ambiguous everything is. And if you want to talk about how people are suffering from imposter syndrome, put them in really challenging situations and then say, oh, and by the way, don't make any mistakes, but be as innovative as you possibly can. Right? And I have a background, I have an MBA, I worked in corporate sort of growing up in my career. But what I really love about the work that we're doing now is we're really shaping the future with all of these elite performers. And I know that Jan does similar work with ultra elite performers. So Jan, tell everyone, what's the work that you do? Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, you know, uh, I will talk a bit about imposter syndrome and then I will introduce what kind of the animal I am, you know, right? Why do we have imposter syndrome and what is it? You know, imposter syndrome, more or less, people think it's like if people underestimate who they are, they, you know, skills, you know, ability to do things and so on. I think that's a part of the answer, big part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that we very often overestimate the other people. OK, so yes. we underestimate us and we overestimate other people. And why is it like that? That's, you know, nature. And you need to train your amygdala, basically, which we call, you know, sometimes your small, you know, monkey. Because amygdala, it, it, from the nature, amygdala is trying to protect you, to save your life, basically. That's why whenever there's some situation which is like dangerous, not very clear, some fuzzy situation, your monkey in your brain is saying fight, flee, or just, you know, freeze, you know, hide somewhere, right? And amygdala works like amygdala is five to ten, ten times faster than your logical part of the brain, okay? So those, you know, emotions and very often negative emotions are ten times, up to the ten times faster than the logic, okay? And this is why 
we are always, you know, overestimating the other people and underestimating, you know, us. Brain more or less, guys, works in such a way that whatever good is happening with you, it's like Teflon. It's go. It goes like that. It's gone immediately. Whatever bad is going with you, it's like, you know, Velcro. It's yes. a lot, you know, it's like, yeah, you are stuck with it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, now, who I am? I spent 22 years in Microsoft, uh, and obviously, I can give you also some examples when I had a imposter, imposter syndrome. Even though I think I did a very good job, because again, I met like you know top guy from the organization, which obviously was a Bill Gates at the beginning of my career, and I figured out, and he was absolutely normal. Then I spent the whole day with him in 1994. He was absolutely normal, you know, guy. And that helped me a lot because you could easily say, hey, I'm young. I'm from the village. I spent 20 years in the village. I almost didn't finish university, you know, right? And my first job was like I was, a, you know, a receptionist at the, at the, in, the, in the hostel, in the student hostel, right? And then I was like facing Bill Gates, the richest person in the world, a very famous guy. And if I would be like afraid of him, uh, I would be, you know, afraid and that would not be good. I was having a lot of respect for him, but I was never fearful right so i spent there 22 years i was a very successful on the business side but i also lived with through some very deep failure i was depressed for six months 10 years ago actually you know it was now it's 10 years ago i spent three months in the mental hospital i i you know fully recovered and I returned back to the to the microsoft and i learned a lot about my brain how brain works if you are really like top performer but then how your brain is working when you are that close to to die basically right it was so bad you know depression so mm -hmm. I, I learned so much about 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 that and today what i do i obviously coach like companies and top executives really like top performers but in addition to that like for five years i'm the mental coach for the czech olympic top team in fact this is new you know uh, t-shirts from, from beijing you know for beijing right for the reason, i have a couple of you know olympic games winners already but i also coach people like patrick she is one of the best you know soccer players in the in the in the world and i also created course for the kids with my dear friend with katarina and we teach that course for we are teaching that course for like five years it's called unlocking children potential so whatever i learn in the corporate you know i try also to figure out like help kids what are their talents how they can you know use it and fight this imposter syndrome very soon right that's that's kind of the you know who i am in the short now to you know uh, kick it back to to lisa guys uh, there is a study every year they do some research at the harvard university you know to get to the harvard it's really very very tough Yes. You need to be smart, you know, right? You need to work very hard. It's tough to get there, okay? Now, up to the 40% of the students in year one, they think they, they, they don't belong there. They have an imposter syndrome, basically, right? And whenever I, because if I have some lessons in Boston, in Harvard, at Harvard, I'm always like running alongside the river. I'm quite slow. I will be 60 now, you know, right? <laughs> I'm not fast anymore. But I'm only one guy, like, smiling. All of those kids, they are fighting from the beginning, like, 5.30 in the morning, and they are already, you know, fighting each other, right? And I, and I think it has to do with um, imposter syndrome at Harvard. Definitely. Absolutely. If I, if I would be professor, then my course would be how to fight imposter syndrome at Harvard. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours now. <laughs> yeah, and I love what you're saying here. And we actually have Karen here who works at Harvard. She's an executive yeah, director yeah. there at Harvard. So she probably knows what you're talking about and maybe has also experienced it herself. Yeah, Maybe she absolutely. can drop us a line it's in the notes. Not, it's not us. only at Harvard. I think it's a, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. Even, and that's even at good. Harvard. This is what I want to share. It's good. But first, before we jump in, what is imposter syndrome? It's that feeling that you have gotten somewhere and it was by luck or by accident and that you didn't really deserve to be there. So whether it's acceptance into Harvard, whether it's a promotion, whether it's, you know, you're being featured on TV and you're thinking, oh, my God, shit, someone's going to find out that I don't really belong here. So you feel like you're an exactly. imposter. 
right? Yeah. And you think, oh, it was luck or there was some mistake that I got accepted to this or something like that. And you don't attribute your success to you being good enough to be there. You think that there's something wrong, that you're not actually good enough to be there. So that's what imposter syndrome is. Now, listen, if you look at studies, they say, I don't know, 50%, 70%, 80%, 100% of top performers I've ever met have felt it at one point or another. And that's what's important to know. So first of all, we're going to talk about how to fight imposter syndrome, but I want to shape everybody's opinion right now, first and foremost, don't try to get rid of imposter syndrome. Why? Because if you're doing something really challenging, really stretching yourself, really pushing to your full potential, you're going to feel uncomfortable there because you're stretching into a new zone where you're not actually good. You are actually not good enough yet if you stay safe. So if Jan had said, okay, great, I came from the village, I worked the reception at a hostel desk, I can really work hard and become the manager of this hostel, right? That's good. That's safe. That's a step, but it's not, you know, that far of a reach. If he said, I want to be the chairman of Microsoft Europe one day, and he said it then, it would have been like, what the, what? Like, ah, it's scary. How could I possibly think that, right? Like, no way that's going to be me. And so that's the point. Always challenge yourself. Anytime you're feeling imposter syndrome, ask yourself, why not me? right? Why shouldn't it be me? And I think, Jan, you said something so important. Meet your heroes. There's a saying, if you don't ever meet your heroes because you'll be disappointed, right? I think that's great. Meet your heroes, figure out they're also humans. They're not that great. And that's perfect because it gives you permission to also be, you know, just you, just you and be good enough being that. Exactly. I, I give you guy. I give you perhaps one example yeah. from the sport, and the the guy. I mean, I was challenging the guy. I, I work with Yeri Lehetska is one of the you know Czech tennis players, right? He, really good one. And when he was a junior, I challenged him. I said, "You are gonna to win, you know, Wimbledon and other Grand Slams." And in after six months, he won junior Wimbledon in doubles. Or, yeah. But, but then I realized. Then I realized this is wrong. That we should. That he should enjoy. The journey, he should enjoy the process, having like emotional connection to tennis and whatever other Grand Slam tournaments will, you know, happen. That's Those are some important points on the way. Bill Gates was always telling me, Jan, I love software and Microsoft so much. The fact that I became the richest person in the world just, be, just, just you know, happened to me. OK. And what, what happened with Yiri in, during the COVID with Yiri Lehetska? He started, he obviously, you know, when he was 18, he started to play like the adult category. He started like 650. This year, he will finish 138. And if, if it's like counted for this year, 103rd. And they were playing over the weekend Davis Cup. And he almost beaten number 12 in the, in the, in the ranking. So he's really enjoying the way. But what I told him, because it's all about imposter syndrome, because now... You know, to to get to like among top two hundred, it's it's great. To but there is a huge jump to be in top one hundred. That's a huge jump because you don't need to play. For example, qualification at Wimbledon, U.S. Open, and all of that. You go directly there, so there's a huge advantage. But then there is a huge jump from first one hundred to top ten. That's a different category. Top ten is a different you know category, right? Exactly. So this is it. But you know, we we he he needs to. You said it. You know. You need to study the best performers, not to be, you know, afraid of and say, when Patrick Schick was playing first time with Ronaldo, I told him, you can take it two ways. You can say, I'll never be that good like him. That would be an imposter syndrome. I'm, you know, from Czech Republic, you know, right, whatever, you know, right. And he's Ronaldo, right. Or you can say, well, I'm 23 and I'm already playing with Ronaldo. And this is very different signal for your brain because your brain works like, you know, chemical factory right so you you work you study ronaldo or whoever is your you know ronaldo and i and i think this is it if we are you know professor dweck talks about fixed mindset and it has to do with syndrome okay if you have this growth mindset which means you enjoying what you do you're enjoying the process and you are like everyday better version of yourself i think that's the way 
how you can, you know, fight it. Here, you know, Karen Isabel talks about, excellent point, about how an overachieving brain can overturn on the positive, but also overturn on the negative spells. Absolutely. We have, it's called, you know, negative uh, bias, okay? Yeah. Our brain is rather picking whatever is negative because amygdala is just, you know, faster. This is it. And and in the, in the nutshell, amygdala tries to protect you, but this is now very often contraproductive because this pressure, this stress is artificial. It's not existing. It's the stress or, you know, the fear in your brain, you know? Exactly. But this is the point. This is what I want everybody to realize. When we were talking about sports, we're talking about business. There's a difference between playing not to lose, like fear based. I don't want to look stupid. I don't want I have to hold on to what I'm good at. I have to prove my expertise or playing to win. And if you're playing to win, it means you know you're going to make mistakes. You know you yeah. have to take risks. You know you're going to fail. And that's okay. You keep moving forward because you're continuously curious about how do I get to the next level? How do I reach? How do I push my boundaries? Absolutely. I'm not protecting. Imposter syndrome is about protecting your ego. Get rid of, I have to be the best. As John said, enjoy the journey. Focus not on proving yourself, which is what people try to do, and focus more on how do I keep being curious about, how do I keep making a bigger impact? How do I keep growing my skill set? How do I keep making the world a better place? And when you're focused externally, when you're focused on the learning, the growth mindset, all of a sudden, imposter syndrome comes into the back. Yeah, of course you're going to fail. Who cares? What's next? What's next? Future focused. What's next? What can I create? You you said one important thing. What what is next? I, I have some players in NHL, the ice hockey players, and I'm telling them always: if they are not, you know, successful like shooting, they should say next, 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 because yes. that's what they. But that's what you do in your life, in sport, in the business, in art. You need to accept what happened because it's past, basically. The problem with amygdala, and that's very much problem with imposter syndrome, that you are not able, your ego is not able, you know, to accept what happened. And that's why you, you suffer once you are losing. And anytime you remember about losing, you suffer again, again, and again, again, you know. What, what Buddha wanted to do, and not, I'm not the Buddhist, right? I'm just, you know, studying the different, you know, thought leaders, right? Yep. Buddha was saying that he wants to push suffering, not, but not from the world around you, but from you, because that suffering is you very often. You said one thing, ego. Ego is never in the present moment. When you are in the present moment, there is no fear. There's like ego is in the past, your fear is in the past or in the future. Very often, imposter syndrome goes like, oh, you know. I, I made this mistake in the past and I need to be very careful now not to make any mistake in the future. And you are not able to concentrate and this is it. And then you are not risking and you, you are not growing, you know, right? So that's, a, and th 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 this is one thing, which is amygdala. The other thing, which has to do with the way how, you know, humankind was organized, it's FOPO, fear of other people's opinion. Because we were living in the groups. We were living in the groups, okay? And whoever, you know, was pushed out of the group was dying, more or less. That's why we have, like, in subconsciousness, hey, you know, what What if I fail of what the other people will tell me? Now, especially on, you know, internet, like, in the past, if somebody was, like, kicking the penalty and missed the penalty, okay, maybe it was, like, in financial times or somewhere in the on Monday, <laughs> hey, he really screwed it, you know, right? Now, it's like, you know, if, if the soccer uh, players are losing the game, it's like in the UK or in Germany, national catastrophe in Germany, national yeah. catastrophe. And it goes like for three, four days, you know. And it, I think and it's, it's on social media and it's in the news. It's all over. It, it's overdone. But obviously, I mean, you can always, like, if you stay who you are and try to be like, like what you do and try to be the better version of yourself every day, this is it, you know, right? And Jan, you've hit on something here. You, we've been talking about the amygdala and a lot of people underestimate how much of your life is actually run by fear because we all think, hey, we're so rational. We That doesn't apply to me. I'm very successful. But actually, unfortunately, you are human and our brains do work that way. And you've talked about fight, flight. There's freeze and appease. 
Right. And oftentimes what happens with appease, that means to just try to please people and to sort of make them happy, that a lot of times we're, we're trying to figure out how do I look successful? Like, and especially in business, it's like, I want people to admire me because that's maybe mm -hmm. how I feel good enough. So what right. do people admire, right? I just coached someone today who wants a Porsche. Why? Because you like cars? No, because I want to look cool to other people. It's called right? status symbol, you know, right? Exactly, exactly. So that status symbol, that's that appeasing. That's that's exactly the ego-based stuff where it's like, I'm not actually interested in being successful because I love the company or I love the thrill of learning something new or building something. I want to do it because I want other people to be impressed that I've done it. That is going to keep you in imposter syndrome for the rest Absolutely. of your life, right? Because there will be still somebody who will have, you know, better Porsche or maybe airplane or whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, I coach billionaires and they're not satisfied. They have all the money in the world and yet this person could do this or this person did that, right? Like it doesn't matter if the game that you're playing is not intrinsically motivated if it's not exciting and interesting and relevant for you if you're doing it for other people it's forever going to be about imposter syndrome if you if you take like the muscle of pyramid of the of the human needs the answer okay. is there already you know right because the the basics you can buy for the money but like belonging you know you can't you know like recognition self-recognition recognition from the others you can't you know and then on the top it's like self-actualization, which which means that I do something I really like. I'm very often in the zone, in the flow. You know, you, you can't for the for the money. That's why there's a lot of people, and there's nothing bad to be rich. It's great, you know, provided that you collect that money through something you love, you know, right? If if you do it just for the sake of the money, I think that's probably not very good, you know. Uh, that's it, it's not right. I co I, I mean, I'm in Zurich, so I coach a lot of people in the finance industry, whether it's in old style banking or whether it's in new startups and fintech. And they all say the same thing. They all come to me and say, I want career advice, Lisa. I want career coaching. But in actuality, what they're feeling is I'm not good enough and I'm an imposter. And, and I said, let's go beyond the money. Don't chase the money. Chase what's exciting and interesting for you. Absolutely. And we have a lot of great stuff going on in the chat. Yeah, here, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you want to highlight it. Yeah, this. and then we can, you know, I still have some, you know, notes here to, to cover about it. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. There is a, yeah, you may take this one, you know, from Karen. Yeah, because this is Karen who's at Harvard. So I mentioned, yeah. hey, she might have that experience. And she said, yeah, neurotic traits are common to these Ivy League undergrads and high achievers in general. I think research suggests that anxiety and depression are important characteristics of those with imposter feelings. Absolutely. Because if you constantly feel not good enough, either you feel like crap because you're not good enough and you're always comparing and someone's always better, or you're feeling anxiety. I have to perform. I have to perform. I have to perform. And of course, you will notice this is the number one thing that high achievers say. But I, if I get rid of this imposter feeling, am I going to be lazy? Am I going to be not as successful because I don't have that anxiety driving me? And I want to clear that myth right now. The answer is no. What you do, instead of just being driven by negative energy where you have to run from something, I have to run from failure. Just take that same energy and make it positive and run towards something. And that's why we're talking about what's your purpose? What's your goal? What do you want to learn? Right. So absolutely. you can still be ultra motivated, ultra high performer, but it's and you use your energy in the positive re-energizing way instead of the exhausting energy draining way. You can still be just as successful. Here is the here is the point. You know, uh, there is a there is a book called Top Dog, and that book is asking the big question: Why you know humankind is competing at all? You know, right? And they are uh, they are citing you know one study from Germany. They they are compare, comparing the stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline in two groups of the people: uh, the professional dancers. You know, they are like. Uh, dancing, you know, 10 years plus, and the people who are uh, jumping out of the airplane for the first time with the with the parachute. So they are, and they suppose, they suppose that those people with the parachutes would have, you know, higher nervosity, higher, you know, stress hormones than those, you know, dancing. It's not true. The first time it was more or less the same level. 
if they, when they were jumping out of the airplane second time, their stress hormones were 40% lower comparing to those professional dancers. They didn't if measure me. My stress hormones are in here. If we, compare, <laughs> if we compare to each other, we are much more nervous when we are like competing. Because th there is another great point from somebody, a LinkedIn user, whoever is the LinkedIn user, a big part of becoming a top performing is also understanding the domain of performance. I agree. Be good at what? Sure. Are we becoming better ourselves as humans or just permanently comparing ourselves in the wrong ways to the others? And this is it. I think competition as such, I think it's a, like scale, okay? On one side, we have like, I want to be compared all the time to, to uh, everybody else. On the other side, it's like, I want to be a better version of me every day, okay? And usually you are somewhere like... I think when I was young, I was like 70% competing with the other 30%. And now it's probably switched off absolutely like 30. I, I don't care that much, you know, competing with the with the with the others. But this is very important. Uh, and I think it starts, you know, in economy because we measure like the GDP, it's very obsolete measurement, you know. Yeah. It does not reflect reality at all, you know, especially with the in the global world. And we just measure it because we're like, hey, there's maybe nothing else. And we are not really measuring what is it. if you take if you take like muscle of pyramid of the human needs, and we still, you know, measure only you know a couple of points there. Right? We don't measure how people are well, there is a happiness index, that's true, but it's not like official, more or less recognized as official me measurement, right? We yeah. still measure it like a GDP, right? Then everybody's saying companies should behave like you know, long term in sustainable way. And we measure them on three months on the quarterly base earnings. Exactly. You know, it's called quarterly base earnings. Come on, you know, right? This is Hippocratic like a hell, you know, right? You you could easily, in my view, right? You could easily measure companies like once a year. You know, you would avoid ups and downs, right? And obviously, stock is a stock market is a great thing because you can, companies can ask for money there, and it, it, it's it's good. But it's really supporting short-term behavior, and we are still saying we're saying you need to be you need to be sustainable. You need to you know compete long-term. Sure, sure, you know it, it goes. You know if if everything goes well, but then it's like COVID, and you know what, right? Uh, well, we, uh, that's it, Jan, because this is our brain. The fear base says quarterly, short term, make it done. The this part of our brain, this brain, this part of our brain that's the most creative, the most rational, the most human. We want to think long term. We want to think in the future. And how do we balance the two? How do we make sure we're covering both? If we're comparing ourselves just to our competitors, what are they doing? What are they doing? You only live short term and you only live fear. If you can balance and say, you know, Apple's famous for saying, we're not even going to look at our competitors. We're just going to create a market, right? They're so future focused that they can actually get to that next level where their quarterly earnings are so great because they can be so insightful. But it takes a lot of trust because you have to override the fear part of your brain. Absolutely. And so you have to. I yeah. absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. So, uh, uh, there is another one from Karen Isabel Franklin. Love that question. We want to succeed, but don't really consider the potential cost and investment it takes. Uh, that's absolutely true. You know, right? Yeah. It, it is. It, 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 it is like that. The you know, we we talk about. I tell you what. Uh, I was once at the, the interesting discussion, you know, uh, Tony Blair already left the government. So he was like advisor or whatever. And I was in the group of the people. There was a Tony Blair, Marlon Albright and so on. And the discussion was about, you know, global warming. OK. And and what Tony said, well, he said, like, if we will do totally shut down of the Western Hemisphere, it's only nine percent of the issue. OK. Because every every week, India or China are opening, you know, new coal, you know, uh, electric facilities. Okay. On the other hand, if when I was sitting with Chinese and Indians, they were saying, "But come on, you know, right? If you take like you know what the pollution per capita, right? We are much better than you guys, and you were you you polluted everything. It's true now those measures, but you know pollution per capita, we are better. So what is it? You need to you know negotiate, and you need to have this dialogue, I think, and and figure out what is it. 
That's the same thing now, very hot topic in the Central Europe, nuclear power stations. For example, my country, we want to do it. Germany, there was a time they did not want to do it. Now maybe they change it. I don't know, you know, right? Like the Nordic countries are doing it. French, uh, France is doing it, you know, right? Those are, you know, things which, which we need to solve. And this is not necessarily, there is a business, you know, inside you need to have. But it's at the end of the day, it's political decision, you know, right? It's like when the European Commission is voting something, you know, like that's yeah. uh, this is it, yeah. But yeah. but I, I I agree with you that this is this is the, the the fact that we are saying like everything will be now green, uh, electricity cars and so on. We don't talk about batteries, which are a huge problem with those cars, you know, right? So th- there is a there is a many you know issues we need to you know figure out. And I think it it takes um, different, you know, view. I would say, it's a it's a bit. It's but, a bit it, yeah. Go ahead. But you see the difference. I wanna I wanna really point out. You're thinking future forward. How do we create this? What do we need? How do we solve these problems? And notice, it's so easy to get sucked back into. Yeah. But the politics of today wants me to go here. Everyone is going to tempt you. Instagram is going to tempt you. Office politics, real politics. Everything in your brain is going to try to tempt you to go back here. And it's your job. If you want to be able to really harness the power of imposter syndrome, it's your job to take the nervous energy that comes from the fear base and re-channel it towards something future focused, something purpose focused for you. So when I compare, for example, I love to compare myself to people who are like extremely successful coaches in the field, right? Yeah, I I could compare myself to you, right? But what I don't do is beat myself up about it. What I don't do is say, yeah, but look what they've done and I haven't done this. What I do is I say, look what they've done. Why couldn't I? I always start with that premise. Why couldn't I? Okay, I can't be an athlete. I'm probably not that good. But whatever they did, I never say come on, never say never. (laughs) Never I I, I might be too old, especially with the birthday coming up next week. I might be too old to be a good athlete. Now I'm 60 and I feel like 40 years old. So so what's the problem? Good. So we can both compete. You should should be like 27 max, you know. Anyway, (laughs) yeah, but that's it, right? So that's exactly what you just said. Instead of that fixed mindset of I can't, which I just did, I can't be an athlete. And you said, no, growth mindset, where might there be possibilities? So I look at my heroes. I look at people who are doing better than I am. And I say, great. What are they doing? How they do it? Why not me? And how do I use that to fuel my potential? Right. And so it's all about me being able to go you bigger know, and bigger. Technical, yeah. technical comment. Yeah. I tell you, I tell you what is the difference. You were educated in the United States and you guys are educated like for the success in your career, how I will, you know, you, you basically, if somebody is successful, you are basically saying what you said, Hey, why I should not do it. Europe is not like that. Sorry. Agreed. Europe is, you You probably know that from Switzerland is the same in my country. I'm like brainwashed by American company for 22 years. So my mindset is very similar to your mindset. But this is because I was in that environment. I was not like educated like that. And it was not like that in my, you know, family. My mother was a teacher. She's still, you know, living. She's great. We love her. But she was, since like four years old, I was compared immediately to the other kids all the time. She was saying, you should not, you should have only, you know, top rating. What other people would say if your mother is a teacher and you would not have a top rating, you would have a B, <laughs> which is like two, you know. And <laughs> yes, don't so, embarrass yeah. your mother, Jan. <laughs> also, our, you know, the way we were like brought up has to do also with imposter syndrome. Because okay. if we are too much compared, uh, like, like the kids, then we are, you know, very rarely able to take a risk to go out of comfort zone and with playing everything safe you know right and i think that this is the reason why a lot of people are not achieving or reaching their potential it's because of the imposter syndrome because your guys there's a one more you know comment on that your brain likes your brain doesn't like any you know changes risk or whatever your brains like predictability your brains is basically budgeting energy 
and well, first of all, it's enabling you to survive. That's the amygdala. And then your brain is budgeting, you know, energy, right? Uh, what we should do, like with your hands, head, or if it's like the mental energy, what what kind of the you know water uh, or salt or, or the uh, or the glucose will, will send you, will be sent and so on. But and for that, your brain's like predictability. It's called homeostasis. Your brain likes like stability. If you do something which is like out of your comfort zone, it's not necessarily you know, very, very stable, right? You know, right? Okay, there's another one. Comment. Okay, go, go ahead. It's important to build spaces of trust and community. I have two things I want to say to this, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps when top leaders are more transparent about imposter syndrome, and that allows for a conversation to happen to build support systems rather than going it alone. So first of all, there's two things. First, you need to normalize imposter syndrome happening. I am telling you, every person you know, imagine your top role model, the person you love, imagine Bill Gates, imagine everyone, Elon Musk, anyone you think, oh, they're successful, they have it together, they suffer from imposter syndrome. I promise you, right? Jan and I sit, we coach top performers, we we coach the CEOs of these major organizations. We coach these Olympic athletes, right? Because they suffer from it. So normalizing it and knowing every person says to me, the first time I explain imposter syndrome, they're like, I had no idea other people thought this. I thought it was just me. No, you're human. It happens to all of us, right? So if the more we can talk about it, the more we can make it normal, the more we realize, oh, it's not such a big deal. That's just the way my brain is reacting. That's just the way my childhood brought me up, right? Don't necessarily think because your brain feels like you have imposter syndrome that it makes it true. And I'm going to give you an example. The, the one that really stands out for me is when I attended this conference it was this like amazing conference that had like, you know, foreign dignitaries across the world. Right. And so I walk in and I'm like, oh, crap. Right. I'm surrounded by prime ministers, presidents, Nobel Prize winners and Lisa. Do I belong there? No. But I just walked in and I said, you know what? We're all human and I haven't maybe done my thing yet. But I belong with a seat at the table, too, because I have some new perspective to share or I have something new to learn and I can be the next generation of these great achievers. So I made a conscious choice. And that's what I want everyone here to do. So Jan said something so important. Our childhood put us into a very particular fear based mindset. Right. Absolutely. It's, it's your job as an adult to learn how to override that. It's your job to notice it. It's not going to necessarily go away because fear will always come back to us if you're doing Absolutely. something risky. But you got to channel that and say, no, I'm going to take it to move forward. Now, the other part that I find interesting here, and then, Jan, I want to know what you're thinking, too. Okay. The basis for why I feel so stable. Yes, my parents raised me in a way because I'm American. They said, you can do anything, right? But what they actually did was they said, we love you no matter who you are, whether they use those exact words or just showed support, you know, in various ways. But what they basically said is if you fail, you won't be rejected. And everybody needs a, a home base where someone says, even when you have a catastrophic failure, we're still going to like you and love you. For some people, that's family. For some people, it's not family. For some people, family says you must perform. Then go find it in somewhere else. But you cannot have nobody who accepts you the way you are. You need someone, friends, family, spouse, colleagues. Someone needs to say you're good enough because you're you, not because you performed this thing. And that is where you will start to be able to take your risks away from imposter syndrome. No. I absolutely agree. And it has to do with self-awareness, which is not taught today, even at the best, you know, schools, right? Because if you understand who you are, okay, and really deeply understand who you are, then you can understand other, you know, people and you can understand where you are the same, where you are, you know, different, where, how you can learn and so on, you know, right? And, and this is, that's why self-awareness is very important in all aspects. People who are more self-aware are also less fearful because they know who they are and they, they know who they are not. 
Edward is. Uh, Edward I love what he was saying. saying you know, uh, just a sec. Uh, Why not? Here we go. Yeah. Imposter yeah. syndrome is not a problem for a CEO with a huge Dunning Kruger effect. Absolutely. This is basically those are people who are hugely overestimating their skills, knowledge, and so on, right? But then when when they are like put down, you know, right? It, it's it's tough for them. But there are there are. It's not only CEOs, you know, right? It it can you know if you are like you know child. In some circumstances, it can help you a better a, a bit, but only a bit because usually when you are faced with the reality, it's like the fixed mindset, more or less. You know, right? Uh, the, uh, this is it. That's why you know it, it doesn't work. So, guys, let's talk now, and I will ask also this question: If you have some, you know, tools how to fight imposter syndrome, let's put it there in the comments. I'll, you know, start, okay? I think feedback, I call, you know, feedback breakfast for the champions is a key thing. And you, you should not ask other person, what do you think, how was it? That's not enough. You should ask after some activity, what should I continue to do? What should I stop? And what should I start, okay? And that's the way how you will, you know, grow every day. That's the feedback from the others, okay? Then what you can do easily to really figure out, hey, I'm on the way. I really did something every day. You can like remind what was going well every day. You can repair. You can, you know, basically it's called reframing. Reframe what was not going very well. Because see, we are learning a lot from our own mistakes, you know, right? There, there is a tendency now. I don't know about the other countries, but at least like in my country and in Slovakia and partially in Germany, there's a tendency for coaches, if they are like coaching the team sport and they are losing big time, they don't talk to the team about it for two or three days. It's absolutely wrong. You need to talk to them immediately. Because I tell you what, if you are making some mistakes, okay, you know, neuroadrenaline is creating spike in your brain, okay? And you basically, and if your coach would say, hey, this, this is what we need to do differently, then it's enabling like neuroplasticity and you will remember what we discuss and, you know, repair the skills very nicely. If you talk about that, you know, mistake after three, four days, forget it. It's gone, you know, right? So th th this is not good. So basically the remind, repair, and then because we have imagination, imagine how you will do it in the future, okay? And that's basically... It's enabling you to create dopamine. Dopamine is reward hormone, so you feel good, but you will have energy, you know, to continue. And you you should feel that progress. I really, every day, when I go to the bed, I'm like three, four things, and I'm like, okay, this was good. I can do this better. G give you an example. I've got like 200 kids, like they were students from the hotel, you know, school, from the hotel university from Holland, Okay. Very successful presentation. Everything was fine, but it was only half an hour. And I was like, there was a too much information in there, okay? Because they were like 18 years old. I said, well, I was like, boom, 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 boom. So next time, probably like 60% of the information, giving more examples, even though it was fantastic. It was very successful. But I still think, hey, how can I do it, you know, even better? And this is it, you know, right? And, and I think this is also the way how you can, you know, fight imposter uh, syndrome, right? Because then, then you can say, hey, it was good, but I can do it always better. This is kind of the, you know, and you mentioned also, if you if you really face somebody much, much better, you can always say, I'm not there yet. In fact, some universities in US, they are not doing F. F is like five in check, which means like fail, right? You didn't pass. They are saying not yet, you know, which, which they think it's good for the brain. And I, I think there is something in it, you know, absolutely. I agree. Go and ahead. I, I wanted to, sh I, I know that, oh, okay. We got something here. Yeah, go, go ahead with, with, with Mika, I think, yeah. The or biggest issue of society is that most people still can't see the big picture. People don't think and they see it's black and white, nothing between. Being able to zoom out and see the bigger picture is actually very difficult for our human brain. Some people naturally are able to do that yeah. more. Some people have developed that skill set more during childhood. But you have to you have to understand that it's actually quite difficult. You know, if you say to people, imagine yourself when you're 90 years old 
it's actually very hard for the brain to really understand that far into the future. So if we want people to be able to think in bigger pictures and really big and really, and I believe me, I train a lot of leaders on systemic thinking, how to really think ecosystem wide, long term into the future, whole economies. But you have to start where it's safe and then grow it and then grow it and then grow it. So for us to talk about imposter syndrome and talk about self-actualization is probably too many steps removed for where many people are. So I love, Dion, what you were saying is like, what are the practical tips that we can just use today? Because one day, one year, two years, three years out, you have to know the end goal is really having a full self-awareness, knowing your purpose, exactly. knowing your strengths. But maybe day one isn't that, you know, isn't that far out. Maybe day yeah. one is just, you know, every day checking in. What could I do even better? There, there is there is another, you know, there's another trick. How to fool your amygdala, how to fool your monkey. Okay. You will always face some new situations. Like I tell you what, I mean, two guys who won some medals at the Olympic Games, you know, they were very afraid on Sunday, you know, and they were like, you know, competing on Monday. Okay. I said, okay, guys, put in the on the paper, like in the center of the paper, put there like Olympic Games. That's the reason why I'm afraid because I feel like, oh, I'm here for the first time, you know, whatever, you know, I, I may fail, right? And around that, you know, Olympic Games, put everything, what you achieve in your life, okay? And like logical achievement, what you did already in your life. And then you will see that that next step whether it's olympic games or some you know presentation or some you know exam when you are you know university student it's just another step in your life because your amygdala is really like dramatizing you know what's going on very often okay exactly. uh edward here is clarifying a little bit you know more because i i talk only half about dunning kruger because it also says that the people with the high ability they underestimate their own you know ability that's this is true here is a why I'm saying that. Here is a mind blowing thing. I talked today to some doctor, you know, right? And he was like during the COVID, uh, he was helping in some, you know, house for like elderly people. Okay. And they were all like like 30 people that were there with COVID, but they have all Alzheimer's disease. What was interesting that almost everybody got only like mind my level of COVID, okay? Obviously, this is not any, you know, scientific study. But when we discuss that, that we think that because of the other disease, their brain is not like dramatizing COVID, like the, the brain of the of the healthy like you know, person, yeah. right? Like ours, you know, right? Because it, it is COVID, but then your, you know, chemical cocktail in your brain, like, you know, uh, uh, adrenaline and cortisol, is creating even worse and then you your immunity goes down so this is quite you know this is quite interesting right this is this is quite interesting it, it is true that more you know more intelligent you are somebody said it then you you think you need to learn even more you know right and it's like uh, th th this is it because the the other thing is edward that if you are like smart and you are learning all the time, the chances are that you are touching with the other smart people and you admire them, you know, right? And you still feel, hey, there's so many things to learn still. And, yes. and that's good. I think that, that that's good. Absolutely. Okay. So Go ahead. We I just want to share another tip that really yeah. worked for me to get rid of my imposter syndrome. And it was this. When I was working, so my earlier in my career, I was working in marketing and I was used to being a high performer. I was used to, you know, getting uh, promotions fast and used to getting good grades at school and things like that. And I got to marketing and I should have been really good at it. I should have been. I understand people. I'm, I'm good with words. Yep. Everything about it should have been right. But I got into my job and. I was okay. I mean, I wasn't terrible, but I certainly wasn't great. And if I had stayed in marketing, if I hadn't moved to Switzerland, I probably would have stayed in marketing and I probably would have gotten to, you know, a director, a VP level, but the whole time I would have known, yeah, I could be better. It's not, I'm not really right. good. I feel uncertain about it. And what, thankfully, when I quit my job and moved to Switzerland and I said, OK, I'm going to take a pause out of my career and figure out what it is that I really want to do. That's when I came across coaching and leadership expertise. 
now I can excel because that's where my strengths are, my natural strengths, my natural curiosities, my natural abilities. Had I stayed in a job where I was good or rationally I should have been good, I would have always felt I'm not a good enough. I'm not at my full potential here because I found my strengths and because I can really achieve. I constantly say I'm not an imposter. I, you know, I, I can really show up and deliver value here and I don't question my value. And so part of imposter syndrome might be the mental game, which is a lot of what we've talked about today. But it also might be just change your context, well, change your circumstances. If, if, I, if someone said to me, go speak at a you know physics conference. Well, sh I should feel like an imposter, right? I'm, I'm not qualified to be there. So also think about maybe you can shift to a place where you are more qualified or you are more confident or capable and be there and double down on where your strengths are. Yeah, I think it, it's spot on, you know, because I mean, when I was in Microsoft and when you are like, you know, a president for Europe, uh, sometimes you talk about the topics. You don't have a deep, you know, knowledge. I, I mean, like 90% of the time I really understood, you know, deeply, like whatever was a Q&A was perfect. But but there were like, especially like some, you know, technical issues when we started to build the data centers and cloud computing. I learned a lot, but it was absolutely, you know, new. So it, it was tough. So sometimes it's also better to say, hey, I don't know the answer. If you give me your card, we will, you know, send you because this is more, you know, technical. Uh, uh, right. Uh, uh, yeah. But uh, but th this is it, because. The, the the one important thing which I think has to do with the what I what I realize people with relatively low imposter syndrome are usually good presenters. They are able, you know, to basically they are not only smart, but they are also able to show that they are smart, you know, right? And I think this is this is interesting. And it, there's a lot of people who think, oh, I'm introvert, I cannot be good presenter. There's nothing to do whether like introvert or extrovert. It's just you know skill you can you know learn and if, if if you are introvert and you will talk about the topic which is very close to your heart you will not take care whether you are extrovert or introvert you just talk you know right that's it you got to follow your energy and you, be yourself that's the that's another that's thing it. how to fight imposter syndrome you know, because you are unique you know everybody people are telling me i don't have any purpose of my life i'm like okay do you think is there another person like joe no I said, yeah, no, unless we will clone people, you are unique. You are one in, you know, 8 billion or whatever. You are unique. So if you have unique genes, do you think that those genes have a unique, you know, purpose? Probably yes. So let's find what's your purpose, <laughs> right? And that's, that's exactly how people, you know, can start to think and figure out, hey, this is it. And like what you said, you know, you move from marketing, which was, you know, good, but not great. And now you move to the great field, you know, right? Yeah. And everyone has to find their way. And I love we have this quote here. Yeah. And if you want to pull it up about okay. finding a community, because this is, again, what we're talking about. How do we normalize yeah. imposter syndrome is going to happen? I'm telling all of you, everybody, you know, who's a high achiever has it. So get used to it. Make it your friend. Don't you're not going to get rid of it completely. So again, Absolutely. just work with it. And one of the best ways you can do that is when you're feeling alone, like this is my problem and I'm feeling alone. No, surround yourself in these conversations with people like us, other high achievers who say like, oh shit, they, you know, they're being real, they're being transparent and they're saying, yeah, absolutely. I'm not good at this. I felt really awkward at this. I totally bombed this. And that helps you to feel better. That calms the fear system that there's something wrong with you. And you start to realize, ah, oh, this is just normal. And that's what I want you to do. The very next time that you start to feel that imposter syndrome feeling, I want you to go, this is normal. This is just my very human reaction to it. And by the way, I'm going to shift it forward and I'm going to use this energy to go towards a goal. What is this telling me? What do I want to get good at? What am I, you know, where, where have I not achieved yet, but I'm excited to not Absolutely. because you have to prove not because you have to play to keep, you want to play to win. Yeah. And, and the, the other thing is, you know, don't, don't try to like fight your emotions there is a great lisa lisa feldman she's probably one of the best now 
uh, working with you know emotions she wrote a couple of books she was presenting to us you know like a year ago if, if you remember at the yeah. ioc she talks about emotional flexibility or emotional variability you know right it, we have up to the like 2000 different emotions and now how you can build it how you can build you know this emotional flexibility right i think the key is curiosity if you will build your curiosity again majority of the of us we lost curiosity in the school because when you were kids, everybody was curious, okay? Everybody, 98% of the kids are showing, if they are six years old, they are showing high creativity. If you want to be creative, you need to be curious. You need to ask a lot of questions. School is telling you how to answer questions, not necessarily how to ask right questions. Then you go, go, go. When you are 25 years old, only 2% of the population is highly creative and everybody is saying in those companies we want you know highly creative people really make a difference whatever but you are not you lost it you know but because there is something which called which calls uh, neuroplasticity which is called neuroplasticity which means like this is ability of your brain to reconnect the those you know connections it's called synapses those synapses are connecting your brain cells your you know neurons right and if you change your environment and you will start to be more curious, for example, what I do when I'm running or when I'm walking, like Nordic walking, I have like 30 different routes to go, you know, and I go back and forth different, right? Every day I try to listen like 20 minutes, some podcast, which I did not have a clue about at all before. It can be like neurosurgeon, you know, podcast or something like that, right? Absolutely yeah. different. Right. And this is the way how you keep, you know, your mind curious and curiosity is good. Also, how to fight fear and how to fight stress, because if your brain is curious, you have like more explanation for different situations. It's all about Lisa rightly said. It's all about our perception. When you see when you change your glasses, you know, right, the world will change. OK, when you when you will change the glasses, you see the world, the world will change for you. Suddenly you will, you will see, hey. Other people are not that smart. They are smart, but I can I can do it, you know, definitely. And you will you will go like that step by step. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that really helped me early in my career. So I was younger and I thought, oh, adults really know what's going on or like older. You know, if you're 50 and you're 60, you've had so many years of experience. They know. And there was a lightning bolt moment for me when I realized like nobody knows. No, nobody. And it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. Like, there's just so much that you can't know. And I loved this. Brian Grazer, who's a Hollywood producer, he's like one of right. the most prolific right. ones, has done amazing stuff. And he also said, hey, nobody knows. They told him nobody's going to want to watch this movie about a mermaid. But he made Splash in the 1980s. And it was one of the you know classics that still to this day people know about. Right? He's had so many hits and he says that I put an idea out there. People think it's crazy. They say it's not going to happen. I put it out and it works. And nobody knows. Companies invest billions. Amazon has lost billions and billions investing into things that very smart people said this is a good idea. Absolutely. Nobody knows. So let go of somebody smarter could have done it differently or somebody else would have done it better. No, nobody knows. You know, so, Lisa, you remind me know. one remind yeah. me one thing. You know, I have a couple of people like from YouTube or from technology companies. I coach them on the how to do business, but they coach me. It's like coaching top down, but also bottom up. They coach me okay. how to use those technologies, how to use YouTube, how to use you know Instagram and stuff like that. This is really the first time in the history when you can use like young people to coach you. You know what I mean, right? Yes. There is a from Mac, Mac, uh, Gavok, you know, uh, the when I get stuck, I sometimes try to tell myself, I don't believe what you think. Stop thinking it's decent. Just move whatever. Call some, uh, someone, ask us. Later, I'm always glad I did it. Absolutely. Because we think that we are our thoughts. Those thoughts are coming from your long term memory. 90% are repeatable every day. It's like 70,000 thoughts. So if you have some negative thoughts, stop and ask, why do you think the way I think? Okay. And you will see, you know, immediately, hey, this is just the the the, the result of my, you know, thinking. This is not happening. Other thing, what, what he's saying here, 
if you do some activity, if, if you are afraid and you will do some activity, you will do a couple of, like they are saying, if you do four to five steps, your, you know, cortisol goes down by 40%, you know, the, the fearful, you know, sin, uh, hormones, right? And I think it's the same, you call somebody or do something, absolutely, you know, I, I absolutely agree. Yes. So I just want to add to that. I always give the advice. So first of all, yes, whenever you notice the thought, stop. It's just a thought. It's not true. And now that you've stopped the thought, you have created a space for choice. Exactly. And now the question is, who do I choose to be? Yeah. And if you're feeling scared and nervous, great. That's what the word courage is for. Brave means I don't feel fear and I do it. Courage means I feel afraid and I choose to do it exactly. anyway. So use five seconds of micro courage, just as Jan said, just take one step, you know, pick up the phone. If you're going to make the call, hit the send button, even if you feel you, it doesn't need to be hard. Five seconds of micro courage and every step forward that you to then take because of it, you start to build your confidence and uh, that's uh, how you get rid of imposter syndrome. Uh, sp spot on. There is some, you know, celebration note. <laughs> so I will, I, will, I, will, I will read it. I will read it. Before we end, happy birthday in advance, Lisa. Do Thank nothing, you. just celebrate and enjoy your day with the family. By the way, I need your help. My girlfriend started to be jealous when I speak about you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, anyone who's listening, don't worry. I'm happily married. So no, no girlfriends, wives, husbands, boyfriends, partners need to be jealous. But what I would say is I do love the, the emotion of jealousy and envy because when we talked about self-awareness earlier today and how it's very hard to build your self-awareness, yeah. start with your jealousy. Who are you jealous of? Who are you envious of and why? What is it that they have that you wish you had? And once you get that awareness, flip it. Don't say, oh, I'm comparing and they have something else and I don't. You say, okay, that's something I want. How do I get excited to start to make progress towards that new goal? Exactly. And that's was, all it is for imposter syndrome. Be, yeah. Before we will before we will wrap up, I will just, you know, uh, follow what Lisa said. Uh, freedom, freedom of choice was brought by uh, Viktor Frankl, who survived a couple of Nazi camps. And in the book, The Man's Search for Meaning, he wrote about it, right? Mm -hmm. Freedom of choice means that you cannot influence in your life very often what's going on, what you can influence, it's your reaction to what's going on, okay? Give you give you one example. What I do, for example, with the ice hockey players or football players, if if there's some foul, you know, and they wanted to react immediately, okay? Very And very often they would go like, you know, yellow card or the red card, and they'll be gone. I'm like, you need to breathe in, breathe out, get back to the present moment, and then you can react. Really, one or two breaths will put you into the present moment and you will think and you know act very differently from like reacting immediately because this is your amygdala amygdala is trying because it's so fast oh shit i need to go after him or after her you know whatever you know right if you like breathe in breathe out you are getting you know back because amygdala is blocking your you know diaphragm right and that's why if you are for the longer time you know nervous you you breathe like that and then you have a pain in your stomach or whatever if you do like breathe in breathe out you are going back to the present moment and for the for the amygdala the regular breathing means okay everything everything is fine and you are like handing over you know the the management of your brain to the logical part of, of the of the brain you know right because logically you would not like, okay if there's a like in the football if there is a fall on you logically you would not you know go and immediately repeat the same thing logically but your amigo say you go after him you know right uh and actually this happened to patrick shake with if there are some you know czech people watching it uh when he was playing against wells he there was a foul you know he, it should be penalty for czech republic but you know referee didn't see it and patrick did like that and then patrick was kicked off you know from the field he got the red card basically and because he was not prepared it was my mistake by the way because we never talked he was he was never eliminated since the junior age he was never eliminated from the game so i thought hey he's absolutely cool fine yeah. but then if you are if you are really getting like superstar on the field everybody is after you right 
so they are provoking him and so but now i think it's uh, yeah it's fixed but it's the same in the in the in the corporate space you know absolutely exactly and this is why we talk about we want to just keep using those lessons and growth mindset and we move forward so i have loved our conversation today about imposter syndrome the last parting wisdom that i want to share with everyone is you're great just the way you are if you're feeling like you're not good enough or other people are better that's your brain and your fear and that's not who you are so you can choose notice it, take your breath and choose to be the superstar and really reach the full potential that's within you because that's who you are. Exactly. Okay, guys, thanks very much. Just, you know, to summarize, this is what we started to do like half a year ago. So there are like, you know, many parts already on the YouTube, my, on my YouTube channel. So you can, you know, subscribe it. There is a part in check, but you will see now uh, the lady, she's, you know, helping me with the marketing. She like put uh, the uh, English part is a different, like graphically different from the, right. uh, from, from the check. So we will see you. Well, first of all, uh, again, all the best to Lisa, you know, and uh, it's great Thank to you. be with you. Uh, and, uh, and uh, in two weeks, we will have a new team, you know, it will, it will be like pre Christmas, you know, so, and if you have some idea about the teams you would like to discuss, just drop it to my LinkedIn or Lisa LinkedIn, you know, it's absolutely fine. And, uh, and thank you because you also contributed by a lot of, you know, good ideas. Yes. So okay. grateful to you all. Have a great one. Good night. Take care. Bye.